three pointed questions. Number one is what do you base all of your decisions and responses on? Second question, what do you do when things don't go according to plan? What's your response? I know personally for me, I hate when things don't go according to plan. I very, it's, it's my sinful nature. I want to be God in a lot of instances. Like it has to go according to my plan and it can't change. You go on vacation and, you know, with my family, that's like, this is the plan. Ultimately, that plan is going to change five or six times and it, it just drives me insane. And ultimately, that's a lack of trust in God's sovereignty. But we start to ask the question is, what do you do? What's your response when things don't go according to plan? And the next one is, what is your motive for being a Christian? We're going to answer these three things in Philippians chapter 1. I titled this sermon, Keep Christ First. And we're going to look at the, the several different ways Paul explains what happens when you keep Christ first. What does it look like? What happens in your life when you keep Christ first? And so we're going to jump in here in Philippians chapter 1, continue on right where we left off, and we're going to start reading in verse 12. Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Keep Christ first. I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. I want us to pray here because we're going to read the next passage later. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I am a weak and incapable man. I know that I am a sinful person. I don't deserve to be up here. I don't deserve to proclaim your word, but Lord God, you have called me to proclaim a word to your people. We learn in the Old Testament that I'm a dying man speaking to a dying people. But Lord God, I have a message that you have given me that that message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That even though we're dying physically in this earth, we have a hope of eternal life in heaven. So Lord God, I ask that your Holy Spirit washes over us this evening. I ask that you get us excited to be with the people of God. And Lord God, ultimately that we will be changed when we walk through those doors. Because Lord God, the, whole, the Word of God is active and breathing and your Holy Spirit is convicting. And I wholeheartedly believe that as we pray and seek you, Lord God, we're going to see a great victory in this church. So Lord God, I pray these things in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. That was good. Amen. Well, this first passage here, the reason I really want to focus on this and move slowly as we're working on here because it starts to build. When you put Christ first, number one, there will be a guaranteed advance. There will be a guaranteed advance. Look at what happens in the passage. When he put Christ first, he said, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What's going on here? Paul begins this, begins this with correcting something. When he uses the words, I want you to know, brothers, he's about to correct something that they believe. What, what's happening to Paul right now? Paul is in prison. He is not being treated very well. He's thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. And what happened? The church at Philippi believed that because of Paul's circumstance, that would halt the gospel. But ultimately, Paul says, no. Just because my circumstance changes doesn't mean the gospel will be halted because he is keeping Christ first. So when we talk about advancing the gospel, what is the gospel? I was teaching youth one time at a church, and I asked them, can you define for me what the gospel is? And they couldn't tell you one thing about it. And these kids, have been, these kids were raised in church, and they couldn't tell you what the gospel, not even what the word meant. We know gospel is the word good news. 
And, and if you want a fun little Greek word, it's euon gileon. It's a kind of fun word to say. That's what gospel is. Euon gileon. It means good news. In, in the days of Jesus, what would happen is actually a military term. Someone would proclaim the good news that when the king would return, someone would go ahead of him and they would proclaim the king is returning. The king is safe. And so they proclaimed the, the arrival of the king. That's what the original context of gospel meant. And so when we tell people that we're preaching the gospel, we are talking about the coming king. We're talking about the Messiah who has arrived. The good news of Jesus Christ. Now the good news of Jesus Christ, it begins with bad news. The ba- well, the good news, part of it, is that God created us. He gave us a wonderful gift of life. But he also gave us a choice. We're not robots. He, gets, he lets you decide whether to obey or reject him because true love is a choice. We rejected him. We turned away from him. We sinned in the Garden of Eden. Why do you think today there's, there's plagues and diseases, birth defects? Why do you think people struggle with anxiety and depression, all these other areas? Why do you think that stuff happens today? Why do you think people are hurting and aging and in pain? People who die with cancer, why does that happen? It's because we live in a cursed, fallen world. Because when we sinned in the Garden of Eden, it cursed the world. And now what happens? God is perfect. He's holy. He's, he's righteous. Holy means set apart. Nothing that is sinful can be in the presence of that which is holy. God is just. Yes, he is love and he is good. But here's the issue. If someone murdered someone, the judge simply said, oh, it's okay. You can go free. That's a pretty miserable judge. That judge should be brought down to stand and get a new one. In the same way, God is just and loving, but he also must punish sin. Therefore, we stand before God guilty as sinners But just because we're the ones who messed it up, Jesus sent His Son. He died on the cross. He took the sin on Himself. He died to sin. He took the punishment we deserved so that whoever surrenders to Christ may be forgiven, washed, adopted from an enemy of God to a child of God. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. Not only that, you also have a home in heaven. You have a relationship with Christ now in this life. You give up your life to serve Christ. We surrender to the one. Listen, God gave us life. We messed it up. And He sent Christ to restore that relationship. God is the one who loves us and cares for us. He doesn't doesn't seek anyone to face His wrath. That's the gospel. And what Paul's saying just because I was thrown in prison doesn't mean that spreading the good news of Jesus Christ has stopped. Because look at what he says. He continues on, I want you to know that what has happened to me, me being in prison, has really served to advance the gospel. Some of these people in the church of Philippi were afraid. They were scared. They were discouraged. They were thinking of the outward circumstances that were happening in life. They're thinking, you know what, just, it's over. It's done. But Paul's trying to encourage them. Listen, God's going to use this. Look at what he says. He says, so that, here's his evidence. Here's his evidence for why he's saying what he's saying. It has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard And to all the rest, my imprisonment is for Christ. The Praetorian Guard, if you're reading King James, it's probably what it says. And the Imperial Guard, more than likely, that was 10,000 hand-picked soldiers. Paul was at house arrest at this current time. He was chained to a Roman soldier. Or more than likely, the Roman soldier was chained to Paul. Because Paul was, he was a machine. And he'd tell everybody about Christ. He's saying that, listen, my circumstance might have changed, but because I keep Christ first, God's using it. 
everyone in the imperial guard, all these 10,000 people, and he says, even all the rest know that my imprisonment is for Christ. The emphasis in the Greek is not on his imprisonment. It's on the reason why. People didn't care why, or that, people didn't care that he was in prison. It was that people cared about why he was in prison. They realized that it wasn't the, just the fact that he was in prison, but that he was there for Christ. Because of his circumstance, well, he kept Christ first despite his circumstance. And even though it may be discouraging to others, or maybe discouraging to you, no matter what situation you are in, it may be seem defeating or discouraging, guess what? If you keep Christ first, God's going to use it. Use it in what ways? In two ways. He says that it become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. If you keep Christ first in your life, realizing that if, if you serve Christ, it's not your life anymore. Paul could have easily looked at a situation and think, man, this is miserable. I'm just going to give up. But he sets himself to the side. He doesn't care what physically happens to him because his number one goal in life is not what he wants to do. It's what God has told him to do. And he's out there proclaiming the gospel. When you keep Christ first despite your circumstance, look at what it affects. It affects the people around you, but it also encourages fellow Christians. It says that most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. This church was afraid. They were fearful because they realized Paul was in prison, therefore the gospel is halted, and we're defeated. But Paul tells them, don't be discouraged. Just because your situation changes doesn't mean God's going to use it. You may be facing a, a terrible time in your life. You may be facing pain. You may be facing sickness. You may be facing whatever circumstance you're in. But brother or sister, if you keep Christ first, God is going to use that. It's going to affect the people around you, and it's also going to encourage other brothers. Your response to your situation will determine those two things. If you're focused on self, then you're not going to help other Christians. If you're focused on yourself, you're going to be miserable. Now, was Paul pretty miserable? Yeah, his living situation was probably not very pretty. But Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The context of that is being content. Whether you have a lot or whether you have a little. If you put Christ first, it doesn't matter whether you have a lot of materials or a few materials. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you're comfortable or uncomfortable. If you put Christ first, earthly situations don't matter. Because Christ is the most important thing in your life. Uh, it, it's sad to see that so many parents have made sports a priority in their kids' lives. And I'm thinking, you know, there's a .001.7 whatever percent chance that your kid is going to become a professional athlete. I'm like, there's a 100% chance that they're going to stand before God. I'm like, this whole entire nation is so consumed with self and so worried about themselves and what they want to do that we're forgetting that the main point, the reason you have breath in your lungs is to give glory back to God. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There will be a guaranteed advance. If you put, when you put Christ first, there will be an advance. The gospel will spread. And you may think, well, I don't, I don't really care about that. If you're a Christian, that's what you want. If you don't want that, you have to seriously examine your heart this morning. The number one thing is giving glory to God and telling others about God and what He's done. Is it, is it, is it stressful, anxiety-inducing? Yes, absolutely. But it's the reason we exist. And look at what happens. If you put Christ first... You can encourage other believers to be bold. You may be in a miserable situation right now, and you barely got in the door this morning. 
But you putting Christ first, other people are going to see that. I visited a, a lady the other day, and if I was in her situation, I would have been pretty miserable. Life just had not given her a good hand. Absolutely terrible things. But she was the most positive individual I've known. That despite all the terrible things that have happened to her, she had a smile on her face. Do you know why? Because she kept Christ first. That despite your circumstance, Jesus is number one. Jesus is not an add-on to your life. He's not some convenient thing you can go to on Sunday morning. Jesus Christ is your life. He's everything. He's not just part of it. You can't compartmentalize your faith. Jesus is all or he's nothing. You just can't take part of him. You've got to take all of him or nothing. I want you to be encouraged. That it may be discouraging to see even other churches dying. It may be discouraging to see so many Christians, so much of Christians, leaving the faith. But I want to encourage you that despite all of that, Christ is still King. Despite all of those things, the Gospel is still going to be preached. People are still going to hear the Gospel. I know that it's hard. Paul was not in the best situation either. But be encouraged. It's, it's going to be okay. Maybe not physically, maybe not in this life. But you are going to be a blessing to other people. And God is going to use you. There will be a definitive advance, a guaranteed advance, that when you preach the gospel, that when you, live, you put Christ first in your life, primary before all other things, God is going to use it. He's going to use it to spread it to other people. Not only that, He's going to use it to encourage fellow believers. There's going to be an advance when you put Christ first. Does that mean your situation is going to look pretty? No. Does that mean your situation is going to be perfect and happy? No. Does it mean you're going to face hardship, persecution, sickness? Yes. But God can use it. We are His vessels. And look at the next few verses. Not only will, when you put Christ first, there will be a guaranteed advance, there will be different motives. Look at verses 15 through 17. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Have you ever been hurt by the church? I sure have. I've been poor or didn't want to be. Church can be painful. There is such thing called a church hurt. But just because a Christian treats you poorly does not mean that Jesus is any different. He's still the same God He always is. Despite what other, some other Christian treats you like. Christians are human. They're not perfect. Some may pretend they are, but they're not. We're all sinful. We're, we all get in the flesh sometimes. And, and the sad thing is... People may have other motives than just simply coming to church and worshiping Jesus. With Paul, the, the, the people who were attacking him were not Jewish leaders. They were fellow Christians. It says that they're a rivalry. Dissension. Selfishness. Church is no place for selfish actions. Because we are one body in Christ. We all work together in unity. And I love each and every one of you. Does that mean it's going to be perfect? No. We're going to get in the flesh sometimes. We're going to have preferences rather than progress. So many churches have died and split over preferences. Now I know that there's been times in churches where some people, it's either their way or the highway. That doesn't work in the body of Christ. It's His way or no way. It's not, it's not your opinions or their opinions or my opinions. It's the Word of God. 
And here, there's fighting so much rivalry. It's these, it's these people who are envious and rivalrous, selfish and insincere. They are fake. All they wanted was the fame of Paul. They wanted the glory and the honor. I, I tell you what, there was an instance in a church where this individual, he wanted to be the youth pastor. They already had a youth pastor. But what did this person do? Instead of surrendering and saying, Thy will be done, Lord God, he started getting people on his side. He, he presented himself to be this righteous, holy person, but in the background, he was gossiping, backstabbing, getting people on his side to the point where it exploded in the church. And that current youth pastor had to leave because of lies. And then that youth pastor stepped in. Now, does that really scream love? A brotherhood of Christians? There's going to be people in church that have different motives. You're going to have to ask yourself the question today, what's your motive for being here? I've known many, many of people who their motive in church was to get their way. And I pray that's not you today. I pray that your motive for being here is holy and loving. That your motive, your reason for being to church is not out of tradition, but it is out of love for your Father. It is out of love that you want to give glory to God and you want to be encouraged by other believers. We can't encourage other believers if we're tearing them down behind their back. Look at what the other Christians were doing. It said that some were preaching for self, thinking. Let's get down to that verse. The former proclaimed, or verse 17, Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking. And then we go up in verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing. There's a reason Paul did that. The reason Paul was so specific on doing that. He's saying, think is a belief or judgment based pri uh, primarily upon one's own feelings. So this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, the knowledge of Paul's mission by his friends is offset by the malicious imagining of his friends. The first group, the, the ones who were preaching Christ out of love, they knew why Paul was there. But the other ones were thinking to use it against him. One is based off of knowledge, objective truth, and the other one is based on one's own feelings. We know that our feelings don't matter. The truth matters. And in the church, some of these people who were preaching out of love, loving Paul, they were doing it out of truth. The other ones were doing it based on their own feelings. Feelings are going to get you in trouble. Now, feelings aren't always bad, but Satan uses your feelings. Whenever you see a church split, it always starts with someone's feelings and letting Satan tempt them in order to cause dissension. And even right here, rivalry, selfish ambition. It all starts with the feelings. My parents, always growing up, they always said, you got to know the difference between the feeler and the knower. You know that Christ has saved you. Sometimes I don't feel that way. Sometimes I feel just absolutely wretched and sinful. But your feelings are not objective truth. What's your motive today? Let's end with the last thing. Verse 18. There will be a guaranteed advance. And there's going to be different motives. When you put Christ first, this church is going to put Christ first. And I'm going to tell you that now. This church is going to put Christ first. But in the midst of that, there's going to be some opposition. Satan's not going to be happy when Christ is preached. There's a story called, What, ha what would happen if Satan took over Philadelphia for a day? He said, The streets would be empty. Houses would be empty. Every church would be filled to the brim. No one would drink. No one would curse. 
Everyone would come to church and they would joyously sing, but one thing would be different. Christ would not be preached. Satan doesn't care what you do, but the moment you start putting Christ first, that's when he gets offended. Because Christ is the one thing that's going to save you. If you, if you take Christ out of church, well then it just becomes a TED talk. This becomes a motivational speech. And there's no substance, there's no point to it. So many churches have taken Christ out for entertainment purposes. You put Christ in it, Satan doesn't like it. And so when you put Christ first in your life and in this church, there's going to be opposition. Satan's going to use people, he's going to use circumstances, all to bring you down and to make sure that you do not speak the name of Jesus. He does not want people saved. And he does not want Christians to be bold. He wants you to be silent. But this is what Paul says in verse 18. He says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Okay. What's the one good thing that came out of it? Christ was still proclaimed. He completely avoids himself in the conversation. It's not about me. At least Christ is preached. People may have gotten involved and try to cause opposition and try to scare the Christians, but Christ was still preached. No matter what happens to me physically, it's okay as long as Christ is preached. This is not an endorsement for you to follow false teachers. Don't, don't trust the words of Benny Hinn or Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland or any of these widely known false teachers. They do not preach Christ oftentimes. But what he's saying is, in their efforts to attack me, in their efforts to let their feelings get the hold of them and attack me for, for what I believe, in that own essence, in their own process of trying to do that, Christ was preached. They may have been attacking Christ, but people still heard the gospel. There's a famous evangelist named Ray Comfort. Hopefully you've heard of him. He has a documentary called The Banana Man. And it's kind of a humorous name, but it's actually an attack on him. He made this, he, it was actually a joke. He made a video about how he used a banana to prove God's existence. And he's doing it as a joke. But so many atheists, top atheists, Penn Jillette, a lot of these big famous atheists were all making fun of him. They even got him on his show. They're saying, how can it, isn't it foolish to believe that Christ would die on the cross for your sins and that if you repent and believe, you'll be saved and forgiven of your sin? And Ray Comfort's like, you just preached the gospel. You may have been attacking me, but Christ's name was still preached whether in pretense or in truth, whether you did it fakingly or meaning maliciously that you wanted to attack, or whether you did it out of genuine sincerity and out of love for Christ, Christ was still preached. That's what matters. What matters is not my own feelings, what happens to me, what I go through. What matters is Christ is preached. It's all about Jesus. So today, are you on the team? Are you with this church? It's easy to let selfishness control your actions. Far too easy. Because we want to be the gods of our own life. We think our way is best. And that goes back to the Garden of Eden. But we're going to put Christ first in our lives, in our situations. I hope and pray that your motive for being to church is not because your grandparents dragged you here. It's not because it's out of tradition. I hope that your motive for coming to church is not because you've just been going here for a hundred years. I hope that your motive for being here is, I want to worship Jesus. And I want to encourage and be encouraged. I want to be fed with the Scripture, and I want to feed others with the Scripture. I hope and pray that's your motive today. And as we have an invitation, what that means is that it's a challenge. 
I'm not a person to be to force a spiritual or in a, a force an emotional response. I don't want that. Because you can come up here, cry your eyes out and accept Christ, and your life not be changed. Your emotions are powerful, but I want you to know what is your motive. Why are you here? I also want you to be encouraged. You may be going through a lot right now, but if you keep Christ first in everything that you do, realizing that it's not about you, it's about Him. God is in control, I'm not. If you keep that first in your life, God's going to use your situation. He's going to use it for His glory, and He's going to use it to encourage other people. And I know it's not fun. It's not meant to be. Christ doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. Our best life is not now. Our best life is yet to come. And Paul says, in light of these momentary afflictions, this is but a, this is but a, a, a vapor of your life. This comes and goes just like that. Eternity is for a long time, ladies and gentlemen. What's your motive for being at church? I love you, and I'm excited to be here. And I hope that you are excited as well. I hope that your spirit is rejuvenated. And I pray that as we have this time of invitation, that you don't have to come up to the altar. You, you don't have to sing the song. A time of invitation is for you and God. You, you don't have to come up here and pray with me. If you want to, you can do that. But whatever it is, it's time for you to get with God. It's time for you to pray and say, I just heard this message. Lord, what do you want me to do? I don't want us to leave here the same way we, we came. Because the word of God changes lives. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we will not become numb to it. So let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Lord, I know today's sermon might have looked a little bit different than what I anticipated. But Lord God, I pray that I spoke the words that you wanted me to say. Lord, I know that you are real. I know that you are powerful. And I know that there are people in here who perhaps... They're coming to church only out of tradition. Lord God, help them today know whether or not they are truly saved. Let them know that your gospel is a gospel that changes, transforms, no longer who you used to be. Lord, we know that your gospel says that the old man is dead and the new man is born. Lord, the, old, the person we were before we were saved is not the person we are today. Yet we still struggle with the flesh. But Lord God, when we keep you first, things may not go according to our plan. Things may not look like the way we want them to look like. It may not be comfortable. It may not be happy. But Lord God, you are with us and you are going to use it for your glory. Lord, it's not about us. It's all about the name of Jesus Christ. Help us never forget that. And Lord, I pray all these things. In the name of Almighty Jesus, King Jesus, Lord, I, I expect you to do a great work because you said you would, that if we keep our eyes on you, we will see a great victory. In your name I pray, amen.